that. How we doing? Hey. Okay. All right. Uh, here's my English essay topic for the day. Two voltages set to 100 kVp, and you get single phase, full wave. Write an essay. Describe everything that you can. Huh? <laughs> what things come into mind? <coughs> Write down a few things that come into your mind. Free association. All the terms should seem familiar at this point, yes? Okay. So they're familiar, you just got to connect them with relevant things. <coughs> Why don't we begin at the beginning? What is the meaning behind the Two words, two voltage. What are we talking about? The X ray tube. And more importantly, we're talking about the voltage in what part of the X ray tube? The filament. No, we're not. Between the about cathode that. and the anode. Not between the cathode and the anode. We're talking about the tube voltage between the cathode and anode that is used to accelerate the electrons. That makes sense, yes? Or no. Maybe disagree. <laughs> and what is the meaning behind the 100 kVp? At the peak of the wave, it's 100 kVp? KV? At the peak, the maximum voltage is 100 kV. And just to be clear, that's 100,000 volts. <clears throat> and is that telling us anything about what's happening to the electrons? This has something to do with the electron energy, the kinetic energy of those electrons. There's a lot of electrons. There are a lot of them. Yes, we don't have to count them, but there are a lot. Yes. What does this have to do with the electron kinetic energy? So I look at that 100 kVp and I see electron kinetic energy. What do you see? They're all moving at the same speed. Not quite, maybe. Depends on what you look into that phrase. If you multiply it by the 
electron charge. If we multiply the kV times the electron charge, we get the electron kinetic energy. And so at their peak, the electrons would have, at the, elect at the peak voltage, the electrons would have a kinetic energy of 100 keV. And just because it comes up, if we wanted to convert to SI units of energy, And we don't do this terribly often, but in case we wanted to, we could convert that thing into joules by multiplying by those numbers. <coughs> and I just put the K in there explicitly to remind you that it's a thousand. We do have to take care of that. So now when we go back and we look at that word 100 kVp, what does that mean to you in terms of the electron kinetic energy? Peak electron kinetic energy is 100 keV. Sort of the daisy chain of thought that I'm trying to get you to be more fluent with. So you see a tube voltage, you know what the maximum electron kinetic energy is. That's all we're really aiming at here. That, that's just sort of the, the thought process. in there, the single phase full wave, what does it mean and how does it apply to this situation? It has 100% voltage ripple. Yes, the lowest voltage is 0 kVp.
the lowest voltage is zero volts in this case. And what more can we infer from that? Well, I, I see where you're going. That was a good try. It's a bit more complex than that one, but that was not where I was trying to get, get to. Uh, although that is related to it. It's a less, less of a number and more of an idea. Kind of the idea of what you were aiming at there. 50% just jumped into your head and you said that was what you're going to go with. <laughs> What's he trying to say with the average electron energy is 50, 50 kV, keV? It's kind of in the ballpark. There's some important aspect here. Also has to do with why we try to get rid of voltage ripple. There's more low energy electrons than high energy ones. That's probably true. It's an inconsistent source. I was mainly aiming at there are low energy electrons. They don't all have the same kinetic energy. There are some low energy electrons as well. And the low energy electrons produce low energy photons, which is why we don't want them. So what I was trying to get at here I was wondering what was driving me nuts. I thought my, I mean, my hearing was going anyway, but that was just that little scratch. Ah. What was that machine anyway? Is that one back there? Okay. So we get low energy as well as high energy electrons. Energy electrons can only produce low energy photons. Is not good. That's a problem. There. So now when you see these uh, a little snippet like that, you sort of realize you can go off for you know two pages on just little information that you know about these things, right? You're worried now. <laughs> next test just one essay question <laughs> I know it won't be I don't want to read it <laughs> I've tried that in the past so but it's always the an idea that you should have some way of you know explaining it uh, largely just because you know you're in the going, you're going to be going into a position where somebody can walk in and ask you something simple like that and you want to well you want to be able to say something besides I just push the buttons <laughs> right, you want to sound kind of intelligent. <laughs> and it turns out that you know you don't have to be able to write the book on these things, but you do have to have an answer. <clears throat> they walk in and they say, well, how does this thing work? And you can start off by saying, yeah, well, it's complicated. <laughs> that, that bought you about five seconds. <laughs> now you start thinking and it says, oh, yeah, well, the electrons are accelerated. And then so you can talk about that for a little while and then they think you know kind of what's going on. And they usually have a busy schedule and they've got other things to do. It's not like you're going, uh, well, off back onto the stuff. <laughs>
So. All right. Um, what I wanted to get at is that we are trying to produce the x-rays. And so where are our, how are the x-rays produced? We have some idea for that, right? The X-ray beam. Can you scroll it up just to kind of? Sure, 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 sure. So we make electrons hit a target. Complicated story behind how the electrons hit the target, but we make the electrons hit the target. <coughs> and in that process of hitting the target, the electrons. What happens to the electrons when they hit the target? They go in a different direction. They come into photons. They don't turn into photons, but they do create photons. They create photons as they're being stopped is the easiest way to think about it. They're actually being deflected and bent around and whatnot. Kind of a complicated stopping process. But in the process of stopping the electrons, photons are created. because that's that beautiful word bridge drawing in German for stopping so in the process of stopping the electrons that bridge drawing process x-ray photons are created as well as a lot of heat say that about 1% of the <coughs> electrons produce photons. So most of the electrons that are hitting the, uh, the target are just not doing us any good, but we don't have any way of getting rid of them. So, but there is the 1% we want, and we just try to make it as efficient as possible to get that 1%. So now if I ask you to consider the only the peak energy electrons, I'm saying we acknowledge that low, low energy electrons are also created, but I don't want to think about them. I'm only going to be interested in the peak energy electrons. So all of the electrons that I want to consider, I'm only focusing in on just the highest energy electrons. And what kind of photons do they create? That is, do they only create high energy photons or do they create something else? They create lots of heat. Yeah, they're they're doing they're creating the heat as well. But they create different they create photons with different energies also. Because not 
uh, as these electrons are having their interactions with the target, they don't always convert all of it into one high energy photon. They convert various amounts of their energy into photons. So they create heat, low energy, and high energy photons. And so now we want to talk about making that spectra. Is the spectra of photons created by our highest energy electrons. Is another uh, little just conceptual challenge. We've been focused on the electron so long, we kind of want to stick with the electron, but we're trying to get off of the electron and focus our energy on the photons. So that's why I'm trying to get you to think. Now, the electrons all had their one high energy, but it produces a broad range of energies of photons. Does that make sense? Okay. And as I mentioned the other day, this point is a point of particular interest. We need to have ways of thinking about what that point is telling you. Highest energy Highest photon energy. minimum wavelength. Highest energy photon minimum wavelength, yes. <laughs> in here. That's really called the Brimstrahlen spectra because that's the process by which those x-ray photons were created was that Brimstrahlen stopping process. Now there's another way that we can create photons, x-ray photons. I'm going to refer to the electron that's coming from the cathode and hitting the anode as a projectile. It's often called the projectile electron to distinguish it from other electrons that might be around. So our 
a projectile electron is interacting with the K-shell electron of the target atom. K-shell should have some meaning for you. And it removes the uh, K-shell electron from the target atom. shell electron is removed it is we've left a hole in that K shell kind of a strange idea the do you remember reading anything about a process of removing electrons from an atom has a name what was it Nuclear. Nope, it's in the. It's not inside the nucleus. It's outside the nucleus. You probably saw that word go by someplace. The the term that describes this is ionization. Uh, removing an electron from one of the shells is called ionization. So what we've done is we've made a positively charged atom. It's missing an electron, right? <coughs> Okay, so now an electron from someplace else falls in that hole. From outside the atom? From outside the atom. The other shell. Uh, well, it actually could be either one. That's why it says someplace else. But we're going to visualize it as from outside the electron, outside the atom. So an electron from someplace else falls into that K-shell hole, and in the process, the X-ray photon is emitted. So now we're thinking back to those electron transitions from the shells back in chapter mm -hmm. three. Or was it two? Might have been two. Okay, so if the electron that's falling in is outside the K-shell, and let's assume that it doesn't have much energy if it's just sitting outside, falls into the K-shell, it loses the energy that's equivalent to the K-shell <coughs> binding energy. And so now we just need to remember what the K-shell binding energy is for typically tungsten. Did we memorize that number yet? I wouldn't expect you to memorize it. <laughs> Let's see. 
He begins another table of this of these binding energies in chapter seven. And that's where we are. Chapter seven. Uh, it's on page one twenty-seven. And uh, the whole set for tungsten. Peggy gives the whole set for tungsten. K shell binding energy is 69 KED. actually a nice table. It gives you, I don't think you had this table in here before, it gives you all of the electron transition energies all worked out for tungsten. I haven't seen that one before. But anyway, the one we want is 69 keV. So that is in our x-ray range, our uh, photo, uh, radiographic uh, x-ray range that we're interested in. And the one thing that you should notice from this is that this is what we get. We don't get a broad range of energies. We just get that energy for that transition. And there are a few other things, like you can go from an M shell down to a K shell, and they generate other specific energies. And what I'm trying to get at is that you get a discrete set of X-ray energies And the name for this spectrum is called the characteristic spectrum. Because it's characteristic of something. But first, let me draw one. So this is different than our Brimstrahlung spectrum because what we get is just a set of spikes. And the, the farthest one out to the right, this is the one that corresponds to the K-shell binding energy. And the others correspond to various transition between the different shells. And so now the next question is, what is this characteristic of? And it is characteristic of the target material. So if you have a different target, like gold or platinum or carbon or something else, you will get a different spectrum, which is important. But the main thing I want to mention here is that actually you always have the two of these spectra together. So a more realistic interpretation of the spectrum is that you see something that looks like this. So you have the Brimstrahlung spectrum. And you have the characteristic spectra.
So we mention all this stuff about the characteristics and we understand the process of them and we're essentially not interested in them. So it's, we just want to know they exist and we kind of want to understand where they come from, but we're not interested in them for two reasons. The <coughs> highest energy is only around 70 keV and that you know, we, we can't get anything higher than that. And second, there's just not many of them. So you can never, you would never use them for, uh, for any kind of uh, x-ray imaging. There's just not enough of them. But they're interesting to note that they exist. And they do tell us what target's being used. So as we go through the periodic table, with, we've got 100 elements approximately in the periodic table. We start off with, uh, what's the first element in the periodic table? Don't look. Hydrogen. Thank you. Yeah. First element is hydrogen. Second one you probably know. Helium. Helium, right. And we're actually interested in things like gold and tungsten way on down there around element 79, 80, that kind of stuff. Uh, but we could consider something like carbon, which is atomic number six. Six. Atomic number six. Oxygen is eight. A few of those. They are very small. Gold is very large. Atomic number 79. So atoms range in size from the very small to the large. How do K-shell binding energies correlate with all of that? They get stronger. They get stronger with size bigger with size yes the bigger the atom the larger the k-shell binding energy why they have more protons so more attractive he's got it thing You're thinking of a nucleus with some protons in here. And you're thinking of an electrons going around it. And oh, here we'll make a specific little loop for the K-shell. And it's in this innermost shell that these electrons are very, very strongly attracted to the, to the nucleus. Because this could have lots of protons and that's only a single electron. So very strongly attracted. <coughs> so the K-shell, the bigger you make the nucleus, the K-shell uh, binding energy seriously increases. So considering that carbon is down at 6 and gold is up at 79, what would you expect for the carbon K-shell binding energies compared to gold? Which? A lot lower. Much lower than gold. Carbon 612 versus gold 79-197.
Okay, so the K shell for gold is up around 70 keV. So we could expect a 70 keV characteristic <coughs> X-ray photon from a gold target. From a carbon target, would we be likely to see a 70 keV K shell characteristic peak? No, because they're, the K-shell peaks depend on the K-shell binding energies, and the K-shell binding energies are going to be low. They're going to be down like a few keV. So, knowing that, if you had two spectra, and you had one spectrum that looked like that, we'll call this A, and then we'll do the other one, I'll try to make it Brim straw and part of it be as same as much as I can. And then I'm going to add in the characteristic <clears throat> peaks. And so you're just looking at the two spectra and you're looking at those characteristic peaks. And which one was made with a low atomic mass, atomic number target? Which one was made with a high atomic number target? B, because of the location of the characteristic peaks, must have had a large atomic number target. A, because of, also because of these peaks, must have had a low atomic number target. Okay. Make some sense? So, yeah. the reason why B has a higher uh, uh, in binding energy is because of those little, pe uh, those little peaks. Uh, I mean, These are the uh, they have the highest one represents the K shell binding energy. Yeah, further, more further to the right than the. This one, yes. It says that the highest one over here is all the way down on this side, and it says this is your highest K shell binding energy, uh -huh. which is small. This one says the highest K shell binding energy is big. So it's closer to the area where it's the highest energy level. Nothing to do with the Bremsstrahlung spectrum, completely unrelated. Okay. But the problem is that they show up together. Okay. Yeah. Now there's a whole bunch of spectra in chapter 7 that you need to take a look at. And in particular I'm looking at figure 714. Because we've just been talking about this target dependence. He draws a couple of graphs that the lowest one seems to do something like this. And it's got a couple of peaks there. And the biggest one seems to do something like approximately like this. And this, that should have been in a different end at the same place and this one has a peak out here and he's saying that this is the gold spectrum and gold has an atomic number 79 and he's saying that this is the molybdenum yeah, that one three times fast So we got, and he's got a bunch of other lines on there. I just wanted to focus on the highest and the lowest. So that's why you should take a look at his graph. Um, what are we seeing? So this chapter is going to be a lot about looking at these spectra and seeing things and writing about them.
Because you have to describe what you're seeing. Uh, basically, a uh, coal that has a higher level of energy than than molybdenum. Molybdenum, yes. <laughs> what do you mean by a higher level of energy? Okay, they were focusing on the peaks because we've been talking about these peaks. That's one way you know it's a gold target because it's got a large K-shell binding energy. And this must be a lighter atomic number target because it's got a lower K-shell binding energy. So that those peaks make a lot of sense correlating with these two numbers, yes? Okay, what else do we see in this graph? So now you can set aside those peaks and look at the Bremsstrahlung spectrum <coughs> and look at uh, other sort of landmarks of these spectra. So these spectra, they both have the same max energy electron, max energy photon. That tells us that the two voltage was set the same for both of these. What does the area under the curve represent? More photons produced. Well, an area under the curve is photons. Number of photons. So I was thinking about the area under the curve and interpret the difference between those two. Assume the machine settings are, are the same in both cases and the only thing they changed was the target. Gold produces a lot more. Gold produces a whole lot more photons. And that's because the electrons as they hit the target have more opportunities to kind of rattle around and have other interactions. So a heavier target produces more photons at all energies. So we've talked about the, so the, the landmarks that you're looking at when you see these spectra. You're supposed to look for the highest energy photon. The second landmark are the characteristic peaks. A third landmark is uh, just the vertical, uh, the, the area under the curve. Those sort of things to look for. And the fourth one has to do with the average energy. Want me to write down that list of uh, mm -hmm. landmarks? Okay, so things we're looking for. One, max energy, photon max energy. So if you were asked to compare two different spectra, that's the first thing I would look at. Two, look for the characteristics. talk about the average energy. So looking at that curve, those two curves, let's talk about the average energy. Okay, thinking about the, uh, gives other people time to think about the average energy. What are you going to say about the average energy? In 
this two spectra that I can't show you. I'll show you. That's mine. Between those two, what can you say about the average energy? The average energy in that spectra. The center. The center. That was a good, good, good call there. Center of what? <laughs> center of the two curves. Are they the same? That that's more like what I was going to go for. Do they have the same average energy? They do not have the same average energies. No. They do not have the same average energies. What are we looking at when we talk about the average beam energy? And this is a sort of a takes a little practice. Uh, we're looking at the easiest way to think about this is you want to find where half the photons are. Where is half the area? We really just go with the median here. Where is half of the, where are half of the photons in each case? Where, what, what point has half the area under the curve? Zero. Zero. <coughs> so let's go for the molybdenum. So we're talking here on the overall, the number and the uh, energy of the photons, right? I'm going to say that that's about half of the area of the molybdenum curve. And half of the gold curve. Well, we got to go out a bit farther, right? And this has to do with the fact that these, both these distributions are not symmetric. But it gives you the idea. We'll talk about this one as being the average. So there's the average photon energy from the molybdenum. And here is the average energy photon. For gold. So we would say that the gold has higher average energy photon. It produces low energy photons, it produces high energy photons, but if we talk about the average, we say gold on average produces higher energy photons <coughs> on average. Notice that the machine setting has not changed, it's the same for both. So it's not like the gold was cranked up higher. It's, this, this is just a property of different targets. Gold will produce on average higher energy photons. Yes. Um, can you uh, show me how you can find uh, average energy? I can't show you. <laughs> no, this is where you kind of have to look at it, and you're looking for half the area under the curve, oh. roughly. It's just kind of an approximate thing. Uh, so you kind of have to get a little bit of a feeling for it. Like the calculations are way beyond the scope of this class. <laughs> No, well, all we're going to do is look at these things and look for half the area. The median is the best number to look at. Where are half the photons? Maybe we can do something along that idea. Let's practice this a little bit. Okay, something like this. Where is the average? That would be a good one, Garrett. In the middle. Okay. What about, we'll just really exaggerate something like this. Where is the average? And again, you're thinking of like half the area. 
in that last case. Yeah, more to the right. And we're not trying to be ex exact on this. It's just kind of like you look at it and you kind of have a feel for it. So we're not going to get precise. So that's what we're talking about an average energy. So, uh, see the landmarks that we got so far. We've got the photon max energy, we've got characteristics area under the curve, and photon average energy of the photon. Figure number 711. For those of you that are wanting to correlate, this is what's in the textbook. Okay, go through your list of uh, four landmarks to go for. <coughs> Number one is always the maximum photon energy. What can you say about the maximum photon energy between these two spectra? Maximum photon energy, maximum photon energy for these two spectra. <laughs> they are the same. So they have the same max energy photon. They have the same tube voltage, the same KVP. Max photon energy corresponds to the tube voltage. And how can you tell by looking at it? They end at the same point. Max photon energy is related to the tube voltage. What else do they have? They have the same K shell binding energy, same characteristics. Top one has more area under the curve, more photons. So I'll label these curves. We'll call the top one A and we'll call the second one, the lower one B. A has more photons. the same average energy. So, out of those four things, they have the same max energy, they have the same characteristics, they have the same average energy, but A has more photons than B. What is the difference between how A and B are created? So the target is the same for both. Go ahead. 
They have different MAS, milliamp seconds, right? So if they have the same maximum tube energy, this means the KVP was the same for both. This means the target was the same for both. Um, the average energy is also related to a bunch of other things that we'll get into. But the only real difference is that A has more photons. And if you want to get more photons, how do you get more photons? You just let more electrons hit the target. do that by increasing the MAS. Which is uh, two current times time. Two current is in milliamps, and your time is in seconds. MAS. MAS. When you see that MAS, you think, well, it's really just telling us about how many electrons are hitting the target. That's what it's telling us. And we increase the MAS, we're increasing the number of electrons hitting the target. You increase the number of electrons hitting the target, you will increase the number of photons. There's a what kind of relationship between MAS and number of photons? Directly proportional, yes. <laughs> Always good to practice that. MAS is directly proportional to the number of photons. Any questions before we move on to the next spectra? This is uh, 712 Duchamp. And he draws two curves. They look something like this. one A, label that one B, and go through the four landmarks. They do not have the same maximum energy. A has a higher maximum energy. A has more number of photons. A has more number of photons. Same target? This is the same target. A and B have the same target. Same 
but of the case shell. How do we know that the same target? That's what this characteristic peak is telling us. They have the same <coughs> peak no matter what. So the target can <coughs> change. Try that one again. Greater average. It's phrased a, a little bit differently than the way I said. A it. has a greater average energy. A has a higher average ener average energy photon. Yes. So let's indicate where we think those averages are. B, well, I'm going to put the B, say, about here. So this will be B average. And A, I'm going to put it out here. Yeah. OK. So now according, well, we're looking at what changed between these two spectra. KVP. Higher KVP, that was the only thing that changed. So, try to word this the other way. A change in the KVP, an increase in KVP causes blank dot 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 higher average energy. Higher average energy, that's one thing. More photons. More photons and higher max energy. <coughs> and a higher max energy. Three things. Increase in the KVP produces three effects, three results. The first two seem quite reasonable. If you increase the two voltage S, you're going to get a higher maximum energy. Yeah, if you spread it out, you're going to get a higher average energy. Those two make easy sense. What is the one that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, at least the first time you see it, is that just by increasing the KVP, you get a huge increase in the number of photons. Why do you think that might be? Correlate this with anything else you've seen before. Yes? Oh, well, I think I lost it. Did they accelerate back there? Maybe? Something with acceleration. Something with acceleration. Okay. Yes, you are on it. Okay. <laughs> yes. What was that curve where we had uh, higher electron acceleration? Higher electron acceleration. Yes, I'm looking for a curve Space that relates current. to tube current and KVP. Do we have a curve in mind for tube current and KVP? Space charge limited. I think we had them. Um, let's see. The other day we had something like that. Some curves, Ooh, right there. Oh, I know. Oh, that's fine. There they are. This will, this will tell me something about it. 
as you increase, if we don't change the filament current, as you increase the KVP, just keep the filament current constant and only increase the KVP, does your tube current change? Yes. Yeah, your tube current changes, mm -hmm. which has a way of increasing the number of electrons on the target. Mm -hmm. So that's why you get more photons produced. Just a quick little correlation. I didn't want to take too much of a diversion over there. But this one also, uh, what it call attention to this particular graph, because one of the most confusing <coughs> ideas in this whole semester is related to this graph. And he doesn't really explain it terribly well, as far as I can tell. But it's called the 15% rule. And his graph is trying to indicate this. This is on page 132 in the book. So an increase of 15% in the KVP is equivalent to doubling the MAS. And he's trying to illustrate that in this particular graph by saying that this is approximately the 15% increase in KVP. And that there is, the second one has uh, twice the area. Graph A has twice the area of graph B, approximately. So, we'll stop here. There's just a couple of things. Between now and Monday, if you could take a look at this chapter seven, there's uh, two more of these spectra to look at, I believe. And just try to take a look and read about what he's saying about that 15% rule. Sure. So, chapter seven, I'll remind you to look at it over the weekend. Oh, Monday, take the day off. Thanks. <laughs> 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 <laughs>